Have you ever thought about how strange it is that certain moments, perhaps from your childhood, stay with you? Pictures, sounds, smells imprinted into your brain as clear as day, while others disappear entirely. I'd like to tell you about the first time my faith was challenged. This is one of those moments that I don't think I'll ever forget. I was born into a fantastic Adventist family comprising my mum, who was born and raised in Burma. She came to Australia at the age of 18 to continue her education. My dad grew up in Kalgoorlie, which is most famous for having a massive hole in the ground called the super pit. And you shouldn't all, you know, clamour and rush at once to visit Kalgoorlie. Please just form an orderly, orderly queue. Both my parents are second generation Adventists and mum and dad took my brother and me to a small inner city Adventist church when we were growing up. It comprised about five kids and about 40 adults and it was a close-knit, amicable community, thankfully, and it was a great place to grow up. I attended a public primary school where religion was never really discussed. And in year eight, my parents enrolled me in a private Baptist high school, which was located about 30 minutes from home. I arrived for my first day at, fi- at this new school filled with expectation that I would have Christian teachers and Christian peers to associate with. That was a novel concept for me. I remember thinking it was great that we had beliefs and values on the curriculum because as a young Adventist kid who'd attended Sabbath school every week for her whole life, I thought I was a shoe in for an A in that class. Don't we Adventists always think we have all the answers? Anyway, there I was minding my own business on the first day of school when a girl named Sally approached me. She seemed friendly, so I stuck with her. She knew what was going on. And things were progressing smoothly when suddenly Sally asked me, which religion are you? Fantastic, I thought. My new friend is so informed and enlightened that we are getting onto religion on the first day of school and it's not even lunchtime. How good is this? I'd never had these types of conversations outside of church before. Buoyed by the prospect of having found some common ground with my new friend, I proudly responded, I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. Without missing a beat, 12-year-old Sally said rather matter-of-factly, Do you know you're in a cult? (laughs) News to me, I thought. (laughs) And I don't recall whether I answered Sally's assertion well or at all, but I do remember feeling a bit shocked, embarrassed, and then indignant that not only had Sally called out my faith tradition, which felt needlessly personal, But because until that point, I had no idea that other Christians perceived Adventism to be anything but a mainstream Protestant religion. Today, Sally is a successful and amazing officer in the Salvation Army. And with her husband, she runs a church in Canberra and does amazing outreach, particularly among the homeless community. I am a massive fan of hers. The reason I share this story is because sometimes awkward faith encounters, like the one I had with Sally, can be fantastic catalysts because they force us to closely examine what we believe and whether those beliefs serve a practical purpose in the world or whether... As Sally suggested, our beliefs are just an elaborate, somewhat comforting, but misguided hoax, which has little practical effect beyond our own community of faith. 
this working out of our faith is not something that only happened during adolescence. And let me tell you, it is not something which just takes place in church. For me, it has been a long process which ebbs and flows across all aspects of life, including my professional life. This working out inevitably includes spiritual highs and spiritual dry patches, both of which are normal and essential parts of the process. Today, I want to share with you some learnings I've picked up while working out my own faith. This necessarily involves me sharing a bit about myself, which is unusual for me and seems I'm a bit self-indulgent, to be honest. But in doing so, I really hope you might pick up something which compels you to consider God's unique call on your life, as well as we all, of course, strive to be proponents of a thinking faith. One of the things I enjoy doing in my spare time is playing ice hockey. I'm an unashamed product of the Mighty Ducks movie franchise. I was, you know what, I preached on this a few weeks ago at a youth rally and it was like silence in the room and I was <laughs> devastated because no one knew what I was talking about. So this film encouraged me to start playing about 24 years ago and I've been playing every season ever since. And, of course, here I am today still modelling my game style on that of the Bash Brothers. There is nothing better. It isn't lost on me that, of course, this is a very odd pastime for someone who lives geographically about as far away from naturally occurring ice and snow as possible, <laughs> uh, but it is what it is. <laughs> I've played in many teams and competitions over the years, from club through to an international level, and it's been an absolute blast. Today in my age state, I still stand by the fact that a game of ice hockey does wonders for offsetting the worst effects of my desk job, and the endorphins are better than any drug this sheltered church kid has ever had. <laughs> Most athletes will understand the concept of a sweet spot. It refers to that perfect moment when a combination of factors results in the maximum response for a given amount of effort. The sweet spot is the location at which the object being struck, in my case a puck, absorbs the maximum amount of the available forward momentum and rebounds away from the stick with a greater velocity than if it was struck elsewhere. The same applies in other sports such as tennis, baseball, cricket or golf, where athletes spend their careers trying to make and then replicate the perfect shot. And there's my golfing buddies right there. I know they both have a perfect golf swing. If you want golf lessons, see Ellen right there, front row. When you find that sweet spot, the ball flies off the racket bat or club in a perfect arc. The thing about the sweet spot is not only does it look good, but it also feels incredibly satisfying because all one's effort and energy combine to produce a spectacular result, sometimes far beyond even the athlete's own expectations. The concept of a sweet spot doesn't just apply to the sporting world. In his book called Cure for the Common Life, author and pastor Max Lucado wrote, ever swung a baseball bat or paddled a ping pong ball? If so, you know the oh so sweet feel of the sweet spot. Life in the sweet spot rolls like the downhill side of a downwind bike ride. But you don't have to swing a bat or a club to know this. What engineers give sports equipment, God gave you a zone, a region, a life precinct in which you were made to dwell. He tailored the curves of your life to fit an empty space in his jigsaw puzzle. And life makes sweet sense when you find your spot. In a Christian context, the sweet spot is found where your spiritual giftedness, skills and passions intersect. 
1 Corinthians 12, 4 to 11 in the message paraphrase touches on this concept too as it reads, God's various gifts are handed out everywhere, but they all originate in God's spirit. God's various ministries are carried out everywhere, but they all originate in God's spirit. God's various expressions of power are in action everywhere, but God himself is behind it all. Each person is given something to do that shows who God is. Everyone gets in on it. Everyone benefits. All kinds of things are handed out by the Spirit and to all kinds of people. This text is important because it gives us in, an insight into the purpose and effect of serving from our sweet spot. As Christians, the search for our sweet spot is not for personal fulfilment, happiness, wealth, or success. To seek only those things is to fall far, far short of our higher and greater calling, which is to be revealers of the true character of God, simply to show who God is. Let me tell you about how I find found my sweet spot or rather how God placed me in a sweet spot. Here's the story part. I'm sorry, but it's illustrative. I learned quite early on that my spiritual gift is administration. (laughs) Obviously, it's the most coveted of all the spiritual (laughs) gifts. It's probably actually the nerdiest and least glamorous of them all but I've learned to embrace it. I love the detail and the preparation that goes into things. I hate going into situations underprepared or with insufficient information. I'm good at collating agendas and setting up structures and processes to assist groups to reach an outcome or overcome certain obstacles. I'm organised and particular Uh, a bit too particular with certain things. And even though at one stage I concurrently sat on 16 boards and committees at the same time and was convinced that I would die in a committee meeting, well-conducted and efficient meetings are my jam. (laughs) Thankfully, but not coincidentally, my gift of administration combines perfectly with my legal training. I studied a Bachelor of Laws and a Bachelor of Asian Studies, Japanese specialist, uh, straight out of high school, with the intent of becoming a corporate lawyer who was proficient in Japanese language and could thereby have my pick of professional opportunities, given the significant trading relationship between Western Australia and Japan. The goal was short-lived because when I lived in Japan, I mostly picked up slang in the local dialect, (laughs) Uh, which was, you know, rather than the business Japanese, uh, which was professionally problematic, uh, but it was super fun at the time. (laughs) But what is clear to me now, 10 years into legal practice, is that many of the skills I need to do my job well are in place already because of what God is doing through me. He equipped me this way. Finally, I'm passionate about things like social justice, equality, Indigenous rights, good governance and healthy churches. So that is the uh, trifecta I was trying to explain to you. The three areas on that Venn diagram as they apply to me. After I'd been working in a small law firm in Perth for the first couple of years of my career, um, I hit a bit of a rut. Even though I loved the job, I felt like I was ready to do something new. That rut coincided with my dad going through some professional difficulties that really challenged our family. That season took the wind out of my sails and made me question the viability of my own career in the law. I was looking and praying for a change when out of the blue I got a call from a church administrator inviting me to accept the role of General Secretary of the West Australian Conference. I was 28 at the time 
and I knew just enough to understand that it was unusual for the Adventist church to invite a young female who was not a minister of religion and had no history of denominational employment to serve in a leadership role like that. I talked to a few people, prayed and decided to accept the appointment. At the heart of it all, I'm someone who owes much to the loving church community which raised me. I'm acutely aware that not everyone has had a happy experience with church like I have had. But then and now, I still feel compelled to give back to this community, our community. I want to do what I can to ensure that our kids have a chance to also grow up in a vibrant and relevant church with Jesus at the centre of it. There was a significant risk in accepting the church appointment because it meant changing lanes professionally at what was a crucial time in my legal career. The law is a very traditional profession in which promotions are usually based upon two things. How many years' experience you have and how much money you make for that firm. Choosing an alternative career path outside of the private or government sector so early on was risky. By working in a church setting, it was possible I would lose my relevance and employability, making the prospect of transitioning back into pure legal work, which I actually loved, less and less likely the longer I worked for an entity like the church. After much prayer, I put those concerns aside and was appointed to the role of General Secretary in September 2017. Thankfully, the President and the CFO at the time were wonderfully supportive of me, as were the members generally. I was really proud of our church that we might do something a little bit different, and I was the different and I was able to find my job quickly and my, sorry, find my feet quickly and um, began enjoying the job. One aspect of the secretary's role, which I didn't know about when I accepted the job, was assisting local churches to become safe spaces for children and vulnerable people. The Royal Commission into Institutional Responses to Child Sexual Abuse handed down its final report approximately two months after I started the role of secretary. And as a result, the entire not-for-profit sector was grappling with the devastating failings of the past and was doing what it could to implement new policies to mitigate the risk of such atrocities happening in the future. I hadn't done much work in that space before, but with the support of AdSafe Limited, an independent body established by our church to engage with survivors and manage complaints of historical child sexual abuse. I was quickly immersed in policy development and implementation, meetings with survivors, and the management of people of concern within our local church congregations. Despite this challenging subject matter, I came to enjoy that part of the job because it felt good to be a part of a process by which our churches could become safer and past wrongs could be brought into the light and addressed in tangible ways. Two and a bit years into my work for the church, I received another call, this time from a senior lawyer who owns a firm in Perth. My only connection with Gus was that I had briefed other lawyers from his firm to actually advise the West Australian Conference, um, you know, on, on some legal issues. I'd had no dealings with this guy, Gus, directly. So you can imagine how shocked I was when he told me that he wanted to employ me because I was a Christian lawyer. As a result of my employment in the Adventist Church, And because of my knowledge of church life and culture generally, Gus thought I had appropriate skills and experience to support the various other churches and not-for-profit entities who were clients of his firm. To cut a long story short, I've been working in the litigation team at Gus's firm for the last three and a bit years. 
About 90% of our clients are churches and not-for-profit entities. It is very easy for me to establish rapport with those clients because we have shared interests and beliefs. I nerd out learning about their governance structures and internal decision-making procedures. They invite me to their church services. I talk to them about what my local church is up to. And I'm generally interested in their success and they are comforted by the fact that I understand their mission and purpose, which naturally informs how they respond to legal issues and, of course, the advice that I give them. Never in my wildest dreams did I anticipate that my act of potential career suicide, accepting a job in the Adventist church, would turn, in to be, turn out to be a stepping stone orchestrated by God to place me in my sweet spot, a job where my spiritual giftedness, skills and passions intersect. It gives me great joy to daily contribute to the work of setting things right, such that not only my clients but the other parties, lawyers and judges we engage with can catch a glimpse of the character of our God, who is also in the business of restoration and seeking justice and mercy. I reckon God loves seeing us find and serve from our sweet spot. So how can you find yours? Undertake a comprehensive spiritual gifts assessment. They're not all the same. Find a good one, start with that. Make a list of your skills and experience and if necessary, um, well, I'd recommend it, talk to people who know you well. They can help you with this. Next, take note of the issues, themes or topics which evoke some kind of emotional response in you. And what I mean by that is it can be anything from a feeling that this is really cool, I want to understand more about how it works, and what the effects are, or this is important and I want to support, become involved, contribute to society via this medium. That's what I mean by something that evokes a response. Prayerfully wait and watch for invitations and opportunities to arise. They might not look how you think they're going to look. And finally, say yes. Say yes, even if the opportunity is risky or non-traditional. While I'm up here, I said to the guys, I said, what's the demographic? Who are we talking to today? And they told me that it was university students and um, young professionals generally. Um, so I don't know whether I'm still a young professional. I feel like I'm ageing out, just like I've aged out of the youth shed in WA. Um, but while I'm here, I just thought I'd throw up a couple of things, um, including a couple of tips for young professionals. One, it's not about you. It's really not. We exist to show who God is, okay? Actually, it is about you. <laughs> you are the apple of God's eye. He wants to see you serving from your sweet spot. I wanted to show you this picture. Um, there's a bit of a story here. Um, this banner is was actually very large scale stuck to a church which is opposite the main university in Austin, Texas. Um, I was in Austin because I had been at uh, the general conference session last year. Uh, general conference sessions do strange things to me. <laughs> um, to be honest, um, there's, there's good things, don't get me wrong, there's very good things about being involved, but sometimes, every time, um, um, it has challenged my faith um, and um, some of the way that faith is sometimes portrayed there, um, it doesn't look familiar to me. Um, so when I saw this the week after the session, I thought to myself, is that not true religion? Isn't that at the heart of who we are and what we believe? You are so loved for who you are right now. It's where it starts and ends. A couple of other tips. Listen to people who aren't like you. In order to listen to them, 
you've got to get to know them. You've got to get outside the bubble. Test your Christian worldview. Check that it stands up to scrutiny. Test it, test it, test it. If it is true, it'll stand. Test it in community. It's a good way to go about it because you're not the only one testing. Other people have and other people will test their faith. This is a good place to do it. These people are good people to do it with. Christian ethics and values are attractive in the marketplace. Hone and embody them. If you say you're a Christian at work, make sure you live up to that that label. Guide your reputation. I wanted to say something in particular about this. Professional circles are small and colleagues and clients have very long memories my learned friend sitting at the back there is nodding vigorously. Beware of how you portray yourself, particularly online. Less is more. The same goes for your influence in the Adventist church. A flippant comment or like of a post or sh- you know, sharing a post here or there might influence how someone perceives you. And it may limit your opportunities for influence even in our own church. Another thing for young professionals, people who one day will have to sell their skills and have people pay for their services. Think about the stuff you post online. Would someone of your parents' vintage demographic feel comfortable to employ you to advise them? There's something to think about. And finally, your reputation reflects who you serve, okay? A couple of other things. Um, Happy International Nurses Day to any nurses that are here. That was yesterday. The reason I say this is because sometimes our institutions, well, at least in Australia, our Adventist institutions seem to um, only train people who are headed in these directions. But what I'm here to tell you is that the church needs people with other skills to serve as volunteers and employees. It's completely okay if you don't fit the traditional mould. This is based on my experience sitting on various church committees. Nathan told you a little bit about those. We have certain constitutional inadequacies which hinder better age and gender balances in decision-making bodies within the world church. This means that at the highest levels of church leadership, um, we predominantly have men aged 50 and above making important decisions. Respectfully... Men, we're grateful for your service and I'll get, <laughs> I'll get to that point. But respectfully, without better representation from women and young people, the strategies adopted by the World Church will never be as potent or influential as they could be had we more women and young people involved in their development. Women and men, old and young are needed to take the gospel message to the world. I want to encourage you because in my experience, the South Pacific Division is an outlier. Lorraine is nodding because Lorraine was at that general conference session with me. In this part of the world, young people are welcome at the decision-making table. Our leaders are willing and really want to hand over the reins to us. They're looking for good safe hands to put them into. You have a shot when you live in this part of the world to end up participating in the the discussions and the decisions. That's all I'm saying. More so than um, other places in the world, which is still surprising to me. Consider the numerous opportunities for professional development, particularly in governance, project management, management of people and teams, and um, as a director of boards. You can get this experience in the Adventist church. Take the opportunity. A 
becoming a person of influence in the church. Start local. Local church is king. We are a hierarchical structure. Local, let me tell you, I've seen all the levels. Local church is where it's at. Your best work, your most important work, your best contributions should happen at a local church level. That is where the rubber hits the road. Engage with people from all generations. I said it before, the older generation is willing to hand over the reins, but they need to know who you are. You need, need to build trust and confidence. Respect past traditions, but don't be afraid to propose new ways for the future. Um, this was important for me going into the conference where things had been a certain way for a long time. Um, it's important to thank people for their work, for their contributions. Um, and then when you thank them, you say, have you thought about this way of doing it? Have you thought about a new way, an alternative way? That's an appropriate way to have those conversations. Learn church structure, use it to your advantage. Turn up to business meetings. <laughs> Turn up to business meetings. Why? Because even if they're talking about what colour the carpet's going to be, it demonstrates that you're interested in the small background things of being in the church. You start at the business meetings, the old people say, oh, Jeremy was at the business meeting, how good. And then they think to themselves, the next time nominating committee rolls around or the next time appointments for a board or something roll around, they say, hey, Jeremy um, had some good things to say at that business meeting, I think we should give him a go. He's probably got good things to say about other things as well. Seek mentors, speaks for itself. They can often give you a seat at the table. This is really important. The people who are sitting on those nominating committees, they nominate names. The problem with everyone at the nominating committee level all being the same is that they don't know who the young people are. They don't know who the young people are. We need to change that. Um, that's a very big problem for us. But Again, intergenerationally, make those connections. They need to know you're a pair of safe hands. In closing and taking things full circle, the high school I attended where I met Sally was called Kerry Baptist College. Not Kerry Baptist Grammar. We went to grammar school. Um, Kerry Baptist College is named after William Kerry, a Baptist missionary minister, translator, social reformer and cultural anthropologist, whose most famous quote, which is also our school motto, is attempt great things for God, expect great things from God. There's a passage in Ephesians that provides a biblical foundation for Kerry's words. Now to him, he was able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work within us to him be the glory in the church and in Jesus Christ throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. As I stand here in my sweet spot, a place where God has asked and enabled me to use my spiritual gifts, skills and passions to show who he is, I can wholeheartedly attest to the accuracy of this text. God is able to do far more abundantly than all we think or ask when his power is at work within us. Even in the midst of doubts and challenges to your faith, I hope and pray that you might also find yourself serving from your sweet spot and in so doing, your faith and that of others will be renewed and strengthened. Nathan, thank you for your help. <laughs>